from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, I'm Michelle Catteray Bradley, a science reference specialist here in the Science, Technology, and Business Division of the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you to the 10th season of our collaboration with NASA Goddard. And today is the third lecture of the eight that we have planned for this season. There is a list available outside of the theater or the room, and you can always check our website or subscribe to our blog to see what's coming up. Today, Dr. Jason Dworkin, Chief of the Astrochemistry Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, will discuss the OSIRIS-REx mission. I'm making lots of eye movements here. Cut that one out. Anyway, <clears throat> it is the first U.S. mission that will return samples from an asteroid to Earth. The findings will highlight the physical and chemical properties of material from asteroid Bennu. The asteroid is a remnant of the early solar system and should contain clues to its formation. Online, I found a description that said it was born from the rubble of a violent collision, hurled through space for millions of years and dismembered by the gravity of planets. Isn't it just thrilling to think of it? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Dworkin has a PhD in biochemistry from the University of California, San Diego, and his research objective is to assess the organic species available for the origin and early evolution of life, with a focus on understanding the extraterrestrial input and origin of molecules relevant for life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dworkin. Thank you so much. Um, what a great uh, um, summary of the mission. I think I'm done. <laughs> no. um, so Sars Rex is, um, is the first mission to uh, return samples from an asteroid. It's also the, uh, the largest sample return of any object since Apollo 17. So I'm be happy to talk to you about that today. Um, as you may know, um, uh, planets and uh, stars are born from, um, from nebula. And within those, um, uh, protoplanetary disks form, and uh, out of which um, planets condense. Uh, these these are um, are vast disks of gas and dust, ice and um, uh, and uh, rocks and organic material uh, that then uh, coalesce into planets and leave behind rubble. Uh, some of this rubble is large and is responsible for the formation of the moon. Other bits uh, are still there in the form of asteroids. Um, this is the, the view that you're often seeing of the solar system up with the, um, the sun and the planets and the asteroid belt and the, uh, outer, the outer planets and the uh, Kuiper belt. And there's a presentation recently about, uh, about the flyby of Pluto. And even further away than that are the uh, Oort cloud, where, where some comets come from. <coughs> now, this is not to scale. Um, on this scale, this is a, a fun little little website, one pixel moon, um, and this is the the scale of that same solar system. You can see how far things are apart, and space is vast. Uh, anyway, so um, planets accrete, and life somehow formed, and um, from that, all life on the Earth uh, is related, and so uh, you are here. And your close ancestors are slime molds and fungus. <laughs> and more distant, distant ancestors are bacteria and archaeobacteria. But we're all, we all share the same fundamental biology, the same fundamental uh, architecture of how life works. Um, and that is all hidden somewhere in the ancient history of the Earth. This is an a excerpt from a, from, oh, this is a cartoon from XKCD. Uh, it's a cartoon you should read. If you don't, you really should. Um, nearly four and a half billion years ago, Earth was, had liquid water. All but, the, uh, all but the crust older than three and a half billion years has been uh, recycled by the mantle uh, by subduction. 
A billion years, the stratigraphic record, the memory of the hill is forever lost to us. What was it like four billion years ago? Earth, what secrets do you have? Come closer. I'll never tell. <laughs> All we have are these stupid tantalizing zircons that tell us that the, about four billion years ago, there was uh, oceans on the Earth and scars in the face of the moon that tells, tells us something about the bombardment history of the ancient Earth. Um, the Earth is mute on its early history. So we have to look to asteroids and comets, uh, meteorites, which delivered uh, water and organics. But the problem is, um, when you search for meteorites, you find them on the ground, in the dirt, or on the ice. You don't know where they came from, and they've become contaminated. So um, if you're afraid of getting a rotten apple, don't go to the barrel, go to the tree from the untouchables. And so um, send a, a mission out to find a connection between the, uh, the leftovers of the early, of the formation of the solar system uh, meteorites, which are disconnected from their origins on, on the ground. You can send a robot. Um, NASA is known for human exploration, uh, which is very exciting and, and very important. But um, robotic exploration is a little bit easier because robots don't insist on in coming back home. Um, and uh, it's, if, a robot, if a robot dies, it's sad but not tragic. Um, and they are smaller, cheaper, and they don't require annual salary when they're out exploring <laughs> the cosmos. And so um, we know, I showed you a little bit about the, the, how the um, clouds are formed from the diffuse medium, condense into planets. And from that, you have uh, information on the um, uh, preserved in the, formation, in the form of asteroids and comets. Uh, and so what we know about the uh, interstellar medium, we know from observations and, and simulations in the laboratory. We know about the ancient Earth, we know from simulations, because the Earth is mute on its early history. To get a real understanding about what was there, you have to have sample return from objects. And uh, sample return are... Um, this is every sample return mission that has ever been flown, uh, starting in Apollo 11 up through Osiris Rex, which launches in September. And uh, these are missions which bring back samples of the Earth to be studied uh, for generations. So for example, in my laboratory, I have uh, a woman who uh, recently published a paper on Apollo 16 and 17 samples. She was not yet born when the samples were collected using techniques that were not designed asking questions thought unaskable when the missions were conceived of in the 1960s. And so that is the power of sample return, that you can um, in, uh, interrogate samples using uh, instruments that have either not, not yet been invented, and so I ask um, young people where they, what, what they will be doing when the sample comes back in seven years, if they'd be making decisions that could set themselves in a position to analyze the sample. Um, uh, they can um, uh, think about questions that we are not yet smart enough to ask right now. You can also fly instruments which cannot be miniaturized. <coughs> Excuse me. So, for example, um, this is a synchrotron beam line, and here's a scale bar. This is a car. And so it's very hard to imagine how you could miniaturize something like that to, to fit into a five-meter fairing to fly to space. Other instruments... <laughs> Uh, give you the analytical power that you can see um, uh, tremendous details that you can never see on an on a, on a actual flight mission, partly because um, once you design a, a mission, the instruments become static. You cannot change them as you come up with new ideas, new questions. Um, you can if you bring the sample back and, and can interrogate it on Earth. Um, so we're going to an asteroid. This is every asteroid that's been visited by a spacecraft. Uh, some are large, like the dwarf planet Ceres, down to something very small, like Bennu, which is the one we're going to, which is half a kilometer across. <laughs> and there are a lot of asteroids. Um, this month, there have been 95 near-Earth asteroids discovered. There are 714,000 asteroids known uh, as of yesterday. Um, and so you can see that, that this is the main belt of asteroids. Here is Jupiter, and there, here's the, uh, the Trojan asteroids, Mars, Earth, um, Venus, Mercury, and the Sun. These red ones are Earth-crossing asteroids. Again, green ones in the main belt, and blue ones 
Trojans, and then there are, of course, other objects further out. How do you pick an asteroid to get to? Well, when we were conceiving of Osiris Rex, at the time there were only 500,000 asteroids, not the 700,000 we have today. Of those, 7,000 7, are near Earth crossing, which means you have a chance of getting to and from the asteroid within the lifespan of a scientist or of a NASA program executive. Um, of those, 192, you can get there and back again with a rocket that we can conceivably build and fund. Of those, 26 have diameters uh, uh, greater than uh, 200 meters. That's important for two reasons. One is uh, asteroids with diameters that are smaller than that. I've got a model out there you can, you can play with. Uh, smaller than that, they spin very fast, up to uh, one revolution per minute. And that has two problems. One is that the loose regolith on the surface gets thrown off and lost, which means it's very hard to sample the loose rock on the surface because it's not there. Even more important, it spins so fast that you can imagine the proximity operations of, of, a, of a spacecraft trying to match um, orbits, match uh, uh, spin rate, with an object spinning at uh, one revolution per minute is challenging. Of those, um, of those 26, five are carbon rich. We're interested in the origin of life, the early solar system, the organic inventory, and so we need a, a, an object that is spectrally uh, uh, very dark and has evidence of organics and volatiles. Of those, Bennu is our choice. Um, and that's because Bennu is uh, uh, its class B object, which is similar to Themis, which is a, um, uh, a main belt asteroid that has uh, ices and organics. Very low albedo, very low density. Um, lots of, of evidence of loose rocks. Very well understood orbital parameters. And by the way, it, it is a potentially hazardous object. Uh, with a chance of hitting the late 22nd century. So lots of time to prepare, not to worry. Um, but the most important reason is that it's the most extensively characterized object that a spacecraft has never been to yet. Uh, we have a, a long campaign starting in 1999 when it was first discovered, and it was observed by numerous uh, ground and space-based telescopes. So we have a very good understanding of what this object is, so that, that way we can plan a mission that is low risk and uh, has a high chance of, of, of success. Uh, the model that's out on the table you can play with is from Arecibo data. Um, that's the giant telescope in Puerto Rico. And uh, generated this, uh, this shape model. And that's the, what the 3D printed model is, is this very shape. <clears throat> and um, in contrast, the uh, uh, comet 67P chermov gerasimenko the comet which the Rosetta mission is orbiting, uh, did, was too far away to have ra uh, radar imaging. So it had um, uh, 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 light curves that could give a model. It turned out to be the shape was actually quite different from we can get from light, light curves. Um, well, no one may get there, but we have high expectation that it will be a basically round shape very much like this, there could be some stretching in either direction, but it will not have these crazy lobes. So it would be a, a, uh, should be a very safe object to orbit and uh, a very safe object to sample from uh, within the usual risks of doing something in space, which is hard. Um, Asarish Rex is a large team. It's led by PI uh, Professor Dante Loretta uh, right here with mascot Penn Rex. Um, this is just the science team. There's, a, there's an even larger technical team of engineers and technicians who have uh, built and designed the spacecraft. Um, Asarish Rex, uh, the name is an acronym, as most things in NASA are. Stands for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, and Regolith Explorer. This is an animation, which I paused for some reason, of, um, of the sampling device and the sampling action happening. Um, the most important thing is to return a pristine sample, which is extremely difficult because pristine is impossible. Um, totally clean is impossible, um, but you can focus on what matters to you and minimize contamination within a reasonable cost uh, and not waste your time cleaning things that don't matter 
and not waste your efforts by letting things become dirty that do matter. So that's contamination um, studies start on day one. And so from the, from the start of the, of, the of the concept of the mission, we were concerned with making sure that we have a pristine sample. Uh, but at the same time, the spacecraft has to work. I like to say that if the sample fell on the toilet, I wouldn't flush. So <laughs> having a contaminated sample is better than having no sample. But I really, really want a clean sample to understand the questions related to the origins of biology. So I, I asked the science team, give me a list of the elements that you, that you really care about and we shouldn't get on the spacecraft. And they gave me these ones in red. <laughs> so I, sh I, I put this up and someone said, oh, actually, polonium's really cool too. So don't put any polonium on there either. I'm like, okay, come on. We're going to make the spacecraft out of Nept Neptunium. And that'll violate our thermal requirements, so we can't do that. Uh, plus, it'll be expensive and dangerous and, and horrible in every way. Plus, you ask the organic people, what do you want? Well, basically, anything that is an organic compound, we can't have. So what we did is we took these and came up with re representative species, amino acids, um, limiting hydrazine, uh, carbon, potassium, uh, nickel, tin, neodymium, and lead as indicators of other geo uh, of uh, total elements for geologic processes or biochemical processes, came up with a limit that made sense to science based on meteorites, and then turned that limit into engineering, uh, which, is, which makes sense for people who actually build the spacecraft. Uh, beyond having a limit on contamination, we also have contamination, um, uh, contamination control uh, that led to contamination knowledge. If you have a spacecraft that meets our control limits, you can still have some dirt. Understanding what that dirt is, is important. And so we have monitoring plates that are on the spacecraft that we'll analyze when it comes back, and monitoring plates in the clean room that the science team is analyzing in parallel to the build so we can understand the low levels of materials that are present that are being launched and sent back to Earth. We also have an archiving campaign of materials that are, um, that are used in, in the production of the spacecraft so we can, the science team can analyze it when it comes back in parallel with the samples, we can understand uh, if they were an issue. So for example, I worked on the Stardust mission and it turned out to the surprise of the science team that something called Synlube was used as a demolding agent in the aerogel. Uh, Stardust uh, had these uh, like um, gelatin-like uh, molds of aerogel that captured the, the, uh, the, the comet dust. And to get it out of the mold, they had to have an, an unmolding agent. Nobody mentioned that. Um, and that turns out to be something like brake fluid, which is this horrible mixture of organic compounds. <laughs> turned out that um, it, it was Synlube 100 was, was used on, on Stardust. The company changed names. The records were lost to arson. Products rights were sold from the company. And the, um, it was actually, I think, the owner's son was interviewed and suspected that Synlube 1000 was actually the same, the same formulation as what was used on Stardust. I guess it was launched years before. Um, <coughs> so as a result, the science team spent six months studying Synlube instead of studying cometary material to understand what it was doing to our samples. And even so, there's still some uncertainty. And so this is a mistake that we have learned from. And so all of these things, we have very tight controls over what is being used, good communication between the science team, the engineering team, and the technical team, and things like this that you have to have to make your spacecraft work we have an, an archive in, in Houston, uh, in the Space Exposed Hardware Lab, where um, uh, so when you write a proposal to get some of the OSIRIS sample, you can get, I would like uh, one milligram of, of OSIRIS sample, and I would also like uh, one milligram of breakout 601EF to understand if that could, could have contributed to the things I'm seeing. So we have all of that. It's being analyzed by the science team now. And just like the sample, 75% is preserved for future generations. Anyway, enough on contamination, my, my pet little thing on the, on the spacecraft. Um, our primary goal is to return and analyze a sample, a pristine sample. Um, it, it, the sample comes back in a Stardust-like uh, uh, sample return capsule, shown here. Uh, returns in, um, in Utah, September 24th, 2023, at 8.53 a.m. in time for the Sunday morning talk shows. <laughs> um, 
actually that is that that time is, is dictated by orbital mechanics we have nothing to do with that but it just happens to work out that way but anyway set your calendars um, number two is to understand how the sample fits in context so for that we will be uh, imaging and spectrally analyzing the sampling site uh, down to the sub centimeter <coughs> so we have a good idea of um, excuse me um, of how the sample that we get back to Earth compares with the immediate location uh, and the context of that sample, something that's, that has not been done before uh, on any uh, sample return mission since Apollo. Um, we will also understand Bennu as a geologic object by um, understanding the geology and dynamics and spectroscopy of, of the entire satellite. Um, we also understand the interaction between at the asteroid and thermal properties. And so this is a, um, a light mill, which you may have played with. I think they sell them in gift shops around here as well. Um, this is like, not quite the Tarkovsky effect, where um, light hits a dark surface. And in, in space, what happens is the light pressure hits the, the dark surface, is absorbed, the object is rotating, and then the light is emitted um, on, on the night side, and that, that acts as a low intensity thruster. And that changes the orbit of the object away from its Keplerian uh, predicted orbits, which is why when people give Im uh, impact probabilities for asteroids, there's this error associated with it. That's because of this extra term that's related to the color and topography of the asteroid. And light mail is a little bit of a cheat because, um, or radiometer, because um, there's actually a rarefied atmosphere. So what's actually happening is the light is hitting the black surface. It's warming up the gas in front of it, and that acts as the thruster. Uh, because otherwise it wouldn't spin nearly as fast using just purely the Yarkovsky effect. Um, and finally, um, there are 700,000 asteroids. NASA's not spending a billion dollars to go to every single one of them. We're going to go to one object and try and understand that as it, from a point source down to the uh, uh, molecular level. And so by using that information, we can then apply with what we can see with telescopes to the other 700,000 objects and understand how they behave. Um, when the sample comes back, we'll be using um, a hypothesis-based study uh, to understand, what, um, to try and probe back to the pre-solar history, protoplanetary disk geologic activity, the evolution of regolith as the object uh, has moved through the solar system, through its dynamic history, and then finally the impact that the spacecraft has had on the sample, including its contamination uh, uh, impact. <coughs> we have a spacecraft. Uh, it's like most spacecraft, it has a science deck that has uh, various uh, cameras and uh, spectrometers. Uh, we have solar arrays like most spacecraft. What most spacecraft don't have is a sample return capsule and a three meter long arm that collects the sample. Uh, the payload um, contains a number of instruments that, that scan from the X-ray to the uh, radar wavelengths from the high gain antenna to, uh, to the student built experiments. Um, OVIRS is, um, this is the image of the spacecraft. Uh, it is built, it is uh, shipped to Kennedy Space Center. And this is uh, the orientation of the flight deck. Here's OVIRS, uh, it's a spectrometer. Uh, ODIS is a different spectrometer. We have a camera, a camera suite that will give us uh, uh, from a telescope image down to a uh, microscopic imager. Uh, or, well, almost microscopic. Uh, we have a, a, a LIDAR, which will give us the, the topography, a student experiment for uh, X-ray mapping to give us elemental composition, and a high-gain antenna, which will uh, provide uh, um, gravity field mapping. The core of the, of the mission is, however, getting the sample. Uh, this is the, sample, uh, the sampling mechanism called TAG-SAM. Uh, it is essentially like a car air, air filter uh, the initial design was actually called MUCAV, which is vacuum filled backwards. Um, uses the vacuum of space and blows a jet of nitrogen gas. Uh, and instead of, like in a vacuum cleaner, you have a uh, vacuum getting sucked, or a uh, vacuum sucks material out. You have um, the nitrogen gas blowing into the regolith, fluidizing it, and getting sucked out into space through the air filter. It has been uh, tested extensive, uh, this is extensively. Um, 
from uh, having a simulated spacecraft on an air bearing. This is kind of like an air hockey table impacting uh, surfaces at different uh, slopes and uh, slicknesses uh, to see how the, the sampling uh, occurs to uh, operating the sampling mechanism at, uh, on a microgravity flight on, on the KC-135 Vomit Comet uh, to make sure that the sampling works and under microgravity to using the same air bearing table to make sure that we can stow the sample head into the sample return capsule. And then here is a, a video of the sample of the uh, sampling head being locked into the sample return capsule uh, with the three, three switches and then uh, backing off to make sure that it actually is in place. Uh, this will be a very similar image as we'll get from the cameras on board the spacecraft to make sure that the head is actually locked in place. Uh, because once we stow the head, we sever the joint cutting it off so that um, uh, when we close the, uh, the sample return capsule up to bring it home, um, this is the one time only uh, action. Now we have nitrogen bottles so we can actually uh, collect three times if we need to. We only want to collect once, but if there's an anomaly we can go back and, and try again and then again if we have to. Um, but we want to collect once to get our 60 grams and as much as two kilograms. Um, in these test flights, uh, we have always collected at least 150 grams, um, usually more like half a kilogram. Uh, and the, the two kilograms is based on packing the head entirely full. That's how much we, we can carry. And that's happened uh, on, on occasion. Um, the Star Trek has been through uh, a lot of history. Uh, the first concept was in 2004. That's when I started working on the project and wrote a proposal and was not selected. In fact, no one was selected that year. And then we, we regrouped and wrote an, a better proposal with a better concept. Uh, and that went to a first cutoff selection and then uh, wrote a, a more detailed proposal and then that was not selected. Um, and then we needed, it became clear that the assembly return mission um, requires more resources than was allowable in the discovery program. So we went to the New Frontiers program, which is a larger cost cap uh, PI-led mission. Wrote another proposal, made it to phase A, which is, this is volume two of the phase A proposal, all 90 copies required by the review team. They've since gone digital, but <laughs> way back in 2009, it was paper, if you can imagine. Um, side visits, selections, lots and lots of meetings. And then, um, we actually began implementation. And so the um, ATLA, which is the um, assembly, test, and launch operations, uh, started March 23rd, 2015. This is the spacecraft being put into a thermal vac chamber. That is uh, a chamber to simulate the, uh, uh, the vacuum uh, and coldness and heat of space to make sure that the systems function. Uh, more reviews, and then last week, the spacecraft was shipped to Kennedy Space Center and unloaded and is uh, undergoing its final testing now uh, until it's ready to launch on an Atlas V-411. Um, and that's code for four meter fairing, one solid rocket motor, and one uh, single engine Centaur stage. Uh, the window opens at 7.05 p.m. Eastern Time, September 8th, 2016. Um, come if you can. <clears throat> and um, because it's hurricane season, we have a 35 day launch window so that if something bad happens, we have lots of time to regroup and try again. Um, so after launch, um, we depart the Earth and then have a, um, a Earth gravity assist one year later to change uh, inclination, get in the same plane as, as Bennu. And then we approach the asteroid uh, initially as a point source and then it becomes more and more of, of an actual uh, geologic object. Uh, we enter an orbit, which is a semi-stable orbit, because in this case, Bennu is so small that the pressure of gravity, or the pull of gravity, is about equal to the pressure of the, of the sun. So it's a balance and basically surf in the gravity field and the solar field between the two, uh, which is why it's very important that our center of mass and our center of area be co-aligned in the spacecraft. Um, once we have understood the... the um, uh, try that again. The the, um, uh, the asteroid better. We will be in a detailed survey to understand uh, our favorite sampling sites. Down select to um, one sampling site, 
do a rehearsal to make sure that we can do every single step of the operation of, of sampling because getting close to an asteroid is a little bit scary. We only want to do it once, the sampling, so that means we have lots of margin for rehearsing it. That is matching the orbit, matching the height, uh, getting very, very close, everything but sampling until we're ready to sample. Um, and then something ca um, happens where um, because it's orbiting the sun, uh, the space, the uh, asteroid gets very close to, or closer to the sun than we would like, and so there's a risk that the sample will get hot after we collect it. It'll, we collect it in the, sample, in the uh, sampling system, and then it's sitting outside uh, the spacecraft on a sampling arm uh, for up to a month because, as I mentioned, the stowing operation is a one, once-and-done operation. We want to make sure that we do it right. Well, that means that it's sitting out in sunlight, and that could get it too hot. So we have this, this period here after the line in the sand, L-I-T-S, <laughs> where we, we will stand down and wait until uh, it's cool enough to actually perform the sampling. If everything goes perfectly, we can sample earlier. But um, there are things called safe modes that spacecraft go through, where if you have like a computer glitch, the spacecraft goes to safe mode, and resets itself, and this happens all the time, on average about twice a year or so. And let's say if, if your spacecraft orbiting Mars, that happens, and then fine, you're still orbiting Mars. Well, we're near an object that has almost no gravity. And so when we hit safe mode, our instructions are drive to the sun, just burn away. But that means that you're now, you've gone from over here to over here, we have to approach the asteroid again and understand what's, what's happening. Oops. Um, and so that takes extra time, and so we've allocated lots of extra time margin to be able to reset ourselves and get the engineering team, the navigation team, to understand uh, where the spacecraft is relative to the asteroid and, and become safe and then approach again. So um, this could take as much as a month after a safe mode, unlike a couple of days. And so we have that, all that margin built in. And then, um, let's see if we can get this to... The Milky Way, home to billions of stars, rising and setting over billions of worlds, including our own. In this vast expanse, how did our sun, the Earth, and the planets come to be? In recent decades, our understanding of the solar system's evolution has greatly improved, but deep questions remain. To answer those questions, Astronomers are preparing to visit someplace very small. Asteroid Bennu. A lump of rock and organic material. The early building blocks of the solar system. Of Earth. Of us. Bennu is a time capsule, and its journey takes us way, way back. Four and a half billion years. The raw ingredients of Bennu and our solar system originated in a stellar nursery, a vast cloud of hydrogen, helium, and dust. Our own sun doesn't yet exist. Nearby are hot stars like this one, quickly burning up its fuel and destroying itself in a colossal explosion called a supernova. The explosion destabilizes our cloud, causing it to collapse. In the geologic blink of an eye, a hundred thousand years, gravity and angular momentum flatten the cloud into a swirling disk. In the center, where molecules crash together tightest, a protostar revs up to incredible pressures and temperatures. Deep within the disk, clumps of dust not much larger than a grain of wheat are flash heated into droplets of molten rock called chondrules. The source of this heat remains a mystery. Chondrules are destined to become the building blocks of the solar system. Coaxed by gravity and turbulence, the chondrules clump. They grow into the first asteroids, into mountains, into planets. The asteroids are rubble piles of rock, metal, ice, and organics. This large asteroid is the parent body of Bennu, 
a protoplanet whose size we can only guess. Closer to the protostar, a planet begins to form. And then, dawn in the solar system. The protostar undergoes fusion and ignites, revealing our sun. But the solar system is far from finished. Jupiter most likely forms near its outer edge, but just 500 million years after the sun ignites, some believe that it slowly moves inward. Its massive gravity ripples the asteroid belt, disrupting countless asteroids and comets, flinging them toward the sun. They rain down on the inner planets, hammering and remelting large portions of their crust. Did these impacts also deliver organics and water, key ingredients for life? Back in the asteroid belt, Bennu's parent body is lucky. It survives this period of heavy bombardment. The solar system cools and calms. Jupiter and its many moons assume the orbits that we see today. Billions of years of quiet follow, more or less. <coughs> then a billion years ago, one theory suggests a collision shatters the protoplanet. Some of the debris loosely coalesces into a new, smaller body, Bennu. But Bennu will not stay in place. Dull, non-reflective, it slowly migrates toward the sun. Solar heating turns its warm side into a low-intensity thruster. Through millions of years, Bennu's orbit gradually tightens until it interacts with Saturn's gravity, altering its trajectory and hurling it into the inner solar system. Close encounters with Earth and Venus follow. Their gravitational tugs may have repeatedly stretched and reformed Bennu, turning it inside out and pulling off loose material. As a result, it has no satellites of its own until now. Today, NASA is sending a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx to explore Bennu and retrieve a sample. Why? Bennu has survived its long journey and settled into a near-Earth orbit, bringing its secrets within our reach. Now it is ready to teach us more about the solar system's history, its formation, its evolution, and our own place among the stars. So you now should, you should be very well armed to understand the, some of the deeper meanings of this presentation, of this uh, this video. Um, the video itself, it, it's, it's very nicely done. Uh, it has, you notice that scientists um, believe, um, one theory proposes, these are all things that Osiris Rex will be testing. These are all testable hypotheses that are built into the mission, summed up in this video, and now you know um, what, what the low intensity thruster is, that's the Olkowski effect. Um, you know about uh, how um, uh, the origin of the solar system could have uh, indicated uh, 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 formation of organics delivered to the early Earth, uh, how um, this asteroid can contain material that we will understand for generations to come, and how now you can become involved and uh, learn more about Osiris Rex uh, at our website, uh, the PI's blog, which has a lot of information, great pictures, uh, and all kinds of other social media sites. And I thank you for your attention. I just know that after that, we have lots of questions. So. Please um, feel free to <coughs> ask your questions to Dr. Dorkin. Um, please repeat their questions as yes. they come up. Thank you. Yes. Your collector. Yes. It looked like you're blowing nitrogen gas and using a vacuum out of space to make mm -hmm. it a vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. Then you pull it off. How do you make sure that the particles don't, they stay in the filter and not go back in? So the question is, how does the collector retain the material that gets inside? Yes. Uh, there is a mylar check valve 
that where material comes in and then it won't fall out of the check valve uh, when it gets trapped in, in, next to the filter. That's how. I have a second question. Okay. In, in your picture of your, of your spacecraft, when it was orbiting, I didn't see a propulsion system to return you. Um, we have a propulsion system. Uh, we, here's the, um, uh, the uh, monoprop tank. Uh, you can see shaded by the solar, solar rays, here are um, uh, monoprop hydrogen thrusters. And this is how we do all of our transfers. These are our main engines. We have tiny little thrusters that help us do uh, navigation around the asteroid. Uh, we have a main engine which will get us uh, back to Earth. Um, what happens is when we get close to Earth, the temperature turn capsule, uh, we divert towards the Earth, release the temperature turn capsule, it spins up, uh, and so is uh, rotation stabilized uh, and enters over Utah with less than a one in one million chance of damaging life or property because it lands in the Utah Test and Training Range outside Salt Lake City. Uh, and then the spacecraft itself diverts away from Earth and goes into heliocentric orbit. So the, the spacecraft has thrusters. Yes, sir. Why are the asteroids located in this tidy belt around the sun? I would expect them to be found throughout the solar system. So why are the asteroids located in, in the asteroid belt? It's really a uh, gravitational pull of Jupiter is the main source. Um, and a, a good question is uh, why are there any planets at all? Why isn't it just gas and dust? Uh, gravitationally, they tend to accrete. And uh, in the asteroid belt, um, there's enough gravitational disruption from Jupiter, and as I understand, uh, again, I'm a chemist, so I, the orbital dynamics is, is a hobby, not a specialty. Um, but it's, it's too unstable there for, uh, for uh, a planet form to actually form. And so that's a belt that is retained by uh, Jupiter and solar interactions. Thank you. Yes, sir. How can, you, how can you be sure that the surface of the asteroid is dusty and would respond to the, uh, the capture mechanism, not shiny and smooth? Right. So how do we know that the asteroid has, has regolith on it? Uh, we have thermal inertia measurements taken from... Um, uh, from the, primarily the Spitzer Space Telescope, as well as some other telescopes, that give us a, um, uh, a thermal inertia of the asteroid. Uh, thermal inertia is how, how long it takes for a solid to cool off when it uh, gets out of the sunlight. And so compare the thermal inertia of beach sand versus um, uh, rocks. And um, uh, uh, beach sand cools off faster because it's finer grain. And so you can use that to tell the grain size. The average grain size is about two centimeters, which is perfect for fitting inside of our, of our sampling system. Uh, and there's bound to be dust. Uh, that's also why we, why we have contact pads on the sampling system, so that if uh, the worst happens and we don't get rocks inside, we'll get dust on the surface collected. Uh, and I'll have an indication of what also the surface is like. Just a follow-up question. Is, is that dust going to be representative of the asteroid Generally, or does it really matter? Just an example. So it, the question is, is, is the, uh, the dust on the surface representative? Boy, if I knew that, we wouldn't have to go. Um, <laughs> and um, we, we actually have conversation. It'll be a very interesting day when we choose the sampling site. For, let us imagine that you have uh, the surface of Bennu, and it's all black, and there's one white rock. Do you want to sample the one white, white rock because it's weird? or the black part because it's normal. Uh, again, that will be an interesting conversation. And it's a PI-led uh, mission, and so uh, there's a council that, that reports to the PI who makes the decision who then gets concurrence from the associate administrator of NASA. And so um, uh, there's a bureaucracy to make sure that we, we make the decision that is um, equally unpleasant to all. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, in the back. How do you match the surface? I assume that uh, you're going to have to be stationary over whatever the surface is that you're going to sample. How do you match its orbit? I assume you know which way the spin is, et cetera. Uh, so the orbital parameters of Bennu is a, uh, a 4.2 hour day as retrograde orbit. We know that already. Uh, when the spacecraft gets close, we'll be able to match it very precisely. Um, because it is such a small object, it's really more like a docking maneuver 
than it is an orbiting maneuver. And so we can use all of the, the tiny little thrusters all over the spacecraft to help us orient ourselves to match the, uh, the, the orbital rotation when we go into uh, our, our, um, our rehearsals to make sure that we can do that properly and then actually mask the, the uh, orientation on the surface. Um, we actually will be generating four maps to help us choose our sample. The first map is the safety map. Make sure we have a site that is actually will not endanger the spacecraft. The second map is the sampleability map to make sure that we have um, uh, sample sizes at that location which can fit in our sampling system, measuring again the thermal inertia and, the, and uh, taking images. After that we have the deliverability map to make sure that the uh, um, navigators can get us to that spot. Like it's not say on the North Pole where it's, the, the rotation is, is um, such that you have to actually spin the, the spacecraft uh, too fast. And then after that is the science map that gives us the most exciting science, the black rock versus the white rock, for example. And so the, the, uh, the addition of these four maps will help us decide the, uh, the safest, uh, most sampleable, most deliverable, most exciting site we can get. Yes, sir. How do you discriminate between material that has accumulated on the object over time and the material that has accumulated on the object over time as a result of gravity and or passing through different as opposed to what the real content of the uh, rock represents. Is there a way of defining that? Or? So it's, it, the question is how do we uh, differentiate between uh, original banding material and material created from other objects? Right. Um, that will be looking at the mineralogy, uh, looking at the, the detailed uh, uh, elemental abundances and isotopic distributions of the sample we get back. Um, they're both very interesting stories. So, for example, the Almohasacita meteorite that uh, landed or, well, um, crashed into Sudan uh, in, what was it, 2010 or so? Two, no, uh, 2008. It was 2008 TC3 was the, was the asteroid, and it was the only time an asteroid was observed in space and especially characterized and then hit the Earth and it was collected. So it's both an asteroid and a meteorite, Almohasacita 2008 TC3. Anyway, that turns out to be uh, a breccia of uh, a whole bunch of different kinds of meteorites thrown together in a really weird way. And what exciting science that will be if, if that's what Bennu is. Uh, but we'll, just as with uh, Amatsasita, we'll be able to determine that by looking at the rocks. Yes, sir. Uh, if you were to hit the jackpot, get everything you'd like, want to know out of this, mm -hmm. what would that be? So what is the ultimate success for this mission? Well, nothing less than the origin of life, of course. <laughs> now, it, it's, it's to um, uh, either prove or disprove theories on solar system formation. Uh, on are there amorphous silicates um, that led to the, uh, um, uh, that tells us about the timing of the Polar Solar Nebula. Uh, what organic compounds are present? Are there uh, uh, excess of say left-handed amino acids, um, something that I, I, I specialize in uh, that led to perhaps the origin of life. Uh, are there, are those amino acids um, of, of biological uh, um, type but not contamination? Uh, are the, what are the, the sugar contents, uh, nuclear bases? Um, there's a, a wealth of, of chemistry that we cannot yet answer from rocks on the ground because of contamination, uh, that this will, will help us understand. Yes, sir. Can you compare this mission to the asteroid meteorite mission that's been proposed and compare them complementary? So uh, this is comparing Osiris Rex to ARM, the asteroid redirect mission. Um, Osiris Rex is a PI led um, mission that was uh, getting there. Um, um, that uh, was selected on the New Frontiers line in 2009. Uh, it is a science-driven mission to return a sample for the purpose of science. Um, ARM is uh, very much like, like Gemini. It's a way to rehearse and practice having astronauts operate in space. Um, ARM is an um, engineering exercise directed by the agency uh, to 
um, understand how to how to work on objects in space to help us get closer to Mars. And it's not science driven; it's technology driven. Uh, if there is a science payoff, then that's great, but science is not the, the driver of that mission. In the case of a Star Trek, science is the driver, and there might be some technology payoffs in how to uh, interact with small bodies, but the purpose is science. So they have entirely different purposes, but also very different stages in their life cycle. The Star Trek is built and about to launch. Uh, Alarm is still a concept. Anyone else? Yes, sir. If asteroids are, are formed from the same materials as the Earth was formed from, why would they have different organic compounds? Why would the origin of life be related to those other objects? So it's um, if the Earth and the and the asteroids came from the same source, why are they different now? Uh, well, for one thing, the Earth melted, um, and partly because of this gigantic, I can't get back to it, this gigantic impact um, that formed the moon that totally melted the earth. Um, after that, uh, life will find a way. Um, life is pervasive. It has totally dominated the chemistry uh, of the earth. Um, geologic processing, like, like um, subduction, has also dominated the crust of the earth. And so between geology and life, the Earth is a highly evolved object. There's not much left of it that's primordial. And these asteroids have never melted. And they've never seen life. And they've never seen liquid water, at least not that we know of. Um, and they've certainly never seen subduction. And so they contain uh, the untarnished history of the, of the early solar system, unlike the Earth, which has been uh, totally, in, totally uh, rearranged. And just as Mars has been rearranged by its uh, geologic history, and Venus has been rearranged by its geologic history. What else? Bennu? Pardon? Oh, uh, Bennu is um, an Egyptian bird god. Um, and so Osiris Rex is, is the acronym for the mission. Um, Egypt is kind of cool. And that's why we went with the Egyptology uh, reference. Uh, and that was initially for the um, early Osiris concepts, which were not funded. Uh, Osiris Rex was the, the, the big, grander version. Sort of as a joke, um, Osiris King. Uh, I guess that's post-Ptolemaic, but whatever. Um, um, and so the joke stuck, and we came up with a backronym for what Rex stands for, Regolith Explorer. And so we had a contest to rename 101-955-1999 RQ-36, something a little more palatable. And um, uh, a young man in North Carolina came up with, with the, the name, and he's been given a ticket to the launch to see it. Um, and so he, he thought that the image of the spacecraft reminded him a bit of a bird, uh, which also led to a uh, parody song, um, Bennu and the Rex, uh, which I will not <laughs> sing here. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.